Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, sorry, we're getting off to a little bit of a late start wrapping up another webinar. We'll get started in about two minutes. Um, so hang tight and thanks for hopping on. And hi, Larry and Joe and Noah, our other panelists. Happy to have you. Good evening, friends. Hello, good evening. How are you? Good. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you and I can hear you. And I can All see right. Joe from Noah. Great. Hey, Joe, how are you? Hi, Noah, how are you? Doing pretty good. Good, good. Doing well, thanks. How are you? Good, good. How's business? You busier than? We've been very busy. We've been fortunate lately. How about yeah. you? Uh, no, it's it's so off the hook. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's definitely been good. So, how many people are you expecting on this tonight, Chris? Um, we will see. Um. 30 some registered so i think people might be trickling in but just in the interest of time i actually think we will go ahead and get started at 703 and so hopefully we have a few more folks pop on the line um, but for everyone who's here already welcome and thanks for joining if you are a homeowner in alameda county you're definitely in the right place if you live elsewhere in the bay area um or you're in Alameda County, you're not a homeowner, we're still really happy to have you. Most of what we talk about should still be relevant. Uh, if you live in a different part of the country, again, we're still happy to have you. Um, have, welcome to stay on, but just know that some of these programs might not be quite as relevant to you that we talked about. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Chris Hunter. I work for Stop Waste. We are a public agency in Alameda County. We serve um, all 17 or all 14 cities in the county, as well as the county itself and two sanitary districts. And we really do a whole range of work related to sustainability in the county, um, related to solid waste reduction, as the name suggests. Uh, we do environmental education. And then there's also a team of us that work on green buildings and energy efficiency programs. And uh, Stop Voice is also the Alameda County representative for the Bay Area Regional Energy Network, or BayREN. Uh, and so BayREN is an organization that represents the entire Bay Area and has all nine counties in the Bay Area. And BayREN uses um, uh, ratepayer dollars. So every month on your PG&E bill, there's a small part of that that goes to the state, and then the state reallocates it back to organizations like BayREN to provide programs. And so BayREN provides programs for single family homeowners, uh, multifamily properties, small businesses, as well as trainings for local government staff and uh, real estate professionals. So we do a really wide range of programs, um, but today, of course, we are here to talk about the single family program, which is called Home Plus, and so it's the Bay Run Home Plus program. So, um, have a pretty packed agenda today. We'll be covering first, I'm just gonna give some context into what's kind of happening in the energy sector. What are some of the big changes that set some of the context for why we're even talking about electrification? And then we'll hear from Noah with East Bay Community Energy about um, your new electricity provider and how you can upgrade to 100% renewable electricity. And then we'll actually walk through what does an electric home look like? Uh, what are the key appliances? What are the key considerations to make? And then we will hear from one of our contractors, Larry Waters, um, and a homeowner in Berkeley who did a full home electrification. And then finally, I'll just cover quickly how to get started, what rebates we offer, um, and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So uh, some quick housekeeping, as I'm sure you've all noticed, um, you're on, you, everyone is automatically muted and has their video off. This is a webinar um, format. If you have questions, there is a Q&A button you can either find at the bottom or the top of your screen. And so please, we highly encourage you to uh, enter questions into that box throughout the presentation. We have Larry as well as um, two other Bayron contractors on the line. And so they're there to answer your questions um, and really 
um, help you, you know, figure out uh, your own project and, and really just help you answer some of these questions. Um, if you have any technical issues, like you're not seeing the screen, um, you can put those in the chat box instead, and we'll try to address that. Um, and finally, also this webinar is being recorded, and so if you have to step out, uh, we will be sharing it with everyone um, once it's uploaded online. Okay, so a little bit of context here. So um, this one I talked about why groups like Bayron and Southwest, why we're so excited about electrification, why we're holding webinars on this, um, and a little bit just some of the context of what's happening. A lot of you might have memories of gas being talked about as the bridge fuel and gas being seen as cleaner than electricity. A couple of things have happened since then. Um, one, the electric grid has gotten a lot cleaner, and two, we've learned a lot more that gas maybe isn't quite as clean as we thought it was. And so, so now really um, everyone is full force thinking about electric electrification and if you're on this webinar, I'm sure you are aware of the need um, to decarbonize as quickly as possible. And that's obviously way too big of a topic to cover in one hour. Um, it's, I'm not going to try, but I do want to just break it down into three key pieces. And um, there's three main buckets that, we, that need to happen in order to decarbonize the economy. And so the first is reducing total demand. And that's partly through um, through greater efficiency, you know, higher efficiency appliances, weatherization, and also partly through behavior change. Uh, the second key piece here is transitioning to a clean electricity grid. And so getting our um, coal and natural gas power plants offline and replacing them with solar and wind. And then the third step, and one that really hasn't been talked about too much until recently is electrify everything. So the steps are, you know, once we reduce our demand, make sure that all the electricity is clean and renewable. Then the next logical step is to make sure everything is running on electricity rather than fossil fuels. And so that's mostly what we will focus on today. I just wanna run through a little bit some of those other pieces, some of the groundwork here. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, California has some of the most ambitious climate goals in the world. Uh, we have a goal of um, having our electricity production at 50% renewables by 2025 and 100% zero carbon by 2045. Um, and we've made really great progress to that. I actually think we are well um, ahead of track on that 2025 goal. Uh, in the entire US in 2019, for the very first time, renewables surpassed coal in terms of total consumption across the country. Um, and you can also see that the cost of solar and wind has really plummeted. And it's actually to the point where in most cases, um, Solar and wind are the cheapest form of electricity that you can build. And so we're really at a turning point here where the grid is getting cleaner. Um, there's been a lot of uh, gains in technologies and what appliances, clean appliances that are available. And so we're really at an inflection point um, for moving to an all electric uh, decarbonized economy. And you can see that also in some of the, on the local level, um, a number of cities in Alameda County have passed all electric reach codes and our gas bans. And so for new construction, no one's gonna come in and shout out for gas right away, but for new construction, um, they're mandating that those new buildings going up must be all, all electric. And um, again, this isn't happening for existing construction quite yet, but cities are starting to think about ways to start encouraging um, existing buildings to go all electric as well. And so that's just kind of the direction that things are heading in overall. There are a couple um, potential issues, you know, for example, the sun isn't always shining, wind isn't always blowing, and that's most well shown through what we call the duck curve. I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but basically what this shows is the amount of um, electricity that needs to come into the grid from power plants or, um, or large solar farms. And so this is taking after all the solar panels and everyone's roof has been taken into account. And so what you see overnight, it's pretty low. People are asleep, not using a lot of power. And then um, it used to be that there's a peak in the morning and then another peak in the evening. But as we've added more and more solar, you see this big dip in the middle of the day. And that's when most of the electricity coming into the grid is solar power and it's renewable and clean. Um, but then everyone gets home in the evenings, turn on, turns on their TV, you know, does their laundry. And there's this big peak right as solar is coming offline. And so this right around 6 to 9 p.m. is when energy is the dirtiest. And so now it's become important, not just how much electricity you use in terms of, you know, reducing your footprint, but when you use it. And so there's a lot of programs right now trying to incentivize um, 
demand response. So doing more of your heavy electricity activities during the middle of the day uh, when the grid is at its cleanest. And then finally, um, as you know, we've seen the last couple of years, there's really a need for resilience and it's not enough to simply reduce our um, level of emissions, but we really need to do it in a way that's uh, building resilience, making sure that we can withstand wildfires, um, extreme heat and earthquakes. So we've seen, you know, the last couple of years, power sa public safety power shutoff events where PG&E will preemptively shut off power in order to prevent wildfire, wildfires. Um, we've all experienced the poor air quality for a couple of weeks every fall now due to heavy wildfires. A lot more people are starting to think about installing air conditioning and cooling capacity um, due to you know, more and more extreme heat days. Of course, there's always the threat in California of a major earthquake. Um, and a lot of people are afraid that if they switch to electricity, you'll be um, more prone to blackouts and power outages. That's not necessarily, necessarily the case. There's actually been models and, and studies done that have shown if a major earthquake were to hit the Bay Area, Electricity would probably come back within a couple of days, at most a week, um, whereas gas could potentially be out for several weeks, up to, up to several months. Um, and so really, we want to start thinking about how can we build homes that are resilient and communities that are resilient and can, um, you know, keep going um, despite these disasters. But what does this mean? Um, in the short term, um, for all of this, taking into account, pg e is going to start charging transition everyone in Alameda County to time of use rates uh, within the next couple of months, probably, I think in June is, is the date. Um, and so what that means is they'll actually charge more for power during those peak hours of 6 to 9 p.m. when the grid is dirtiest, um, and electricity will be cheaper during the middle of the day. And so that will be happening um, pretty soon. I'm sure you've gotten some letters from PG&E explaining that process. Um, and then a little bit longer term, um, we expect that as more and more people get off gas, the price of that gas is actually going to go up because most of the cost is from the infrastructure, maintaining the pipes and um, things like that. And so it's a fixed cost. And so as people get off gas, it's going to be the same num the same amount of costs paid for by fewer and fewer people. And so I want to start thinking too about, you know, uh, even though electricity is a little bit more expensive right now, that might not always be the case. And then finally, there, we're just going to see a lot more demand for uh, solar panels and battery storage. Uh, Noah will talk a little bit about that um, and what EBT is doing to address that. And we'll also see um, probably a much bigger focus on indoor air quality. And so I'll address that a little bit and how electrification can help during those in, you know, heavy smoke days of keeping your, the air inside your house clean as well. Um, so with that, Noah, why don't you take it away? Yeah, uh, hello everyone. I'm just gonna give a, a brief overview of um, who East Bay Community Energy is, what we do um, and what we offer. So East Bay Community Energy is essentially uh, a not-for-profit energy provider for uh, all of Alameda County, minus the city of Alameda uh, and also uh, the city of Tracy and San Joaquin County. Um, and essentially what we what we do is we, because we are the electricity provider, we have revenue from that and we reinvest um, earnings through the sale of energy back into the community um, through local green energy, local jobs, local energy uh, development, and uh, local programs as well. So you can jump to the next slide. And essentially, how it works is EBCE uh, handles the purchasing, uh, essentially the procurement um, and development of new clean power plants uh, for EBCE customers and sells that directly to customers. Um, PG&E, as always, handles the delivery of that, and then you get all the benefits um, of having cleaner um, lower priced or cost comparable electricity. You can jump to the next slide. Uh, some of the benefits of um, having East Bay Community Energy, which utilizes a public uh, model, is that you can have lower or comparable rates compared to PG&E, uh, control through local uh, communities uh, over how your local power provider operates and runs and invests uh, revenue, um, a greater uh, sustainability benefits through greater uh, reliability on renewables, um, and more direct programs to the community through um, local sponsorships and uh, energy programs. Let me jump to the next slide. Um, so this is just a map of our service territory, including essentially all of Alameda County, with the three new communities that we actually just welcomed this month in yellow, being Newark, Pleasanton, and Tracy. 
So if you're coming from any of those communities, you've probably received quite a bit of uh, information from us, hopefully, uh, and letting you know that we are gonna be your essentially new power provider. You can jump to the next slide. Um, and so essentially EBC offers uh, three products that uh, residents can choose from to be their, you know, their electricity product. Uh, we have our Bright Choice product, which is 1% below price below PG&E. Um, our Brilliant Choice, our Brilliant 100 product, which is 100% carbon free, um, including hydropower and is priced the same as PG&E. And then we have our Renewable 100 product, which is 100% California solar and wind energy, uh, priced one cent above PG&E. Um, when thinking about how individuals at like the residential level, like you and I, just everyone at home can make a greater impact for the, the choices we make as far as where our energy comes from, uh, opting up to Renewable 100 is gonna be one of those major impacts because you can essentially ensure that uh, more money that you're paying for your electricity is being uh, put towards the development and purchase of renewable uh, energy sources. So you can jump to the next slide. Um, one thing I'll note here is that um, if, you, if you're not sure if you are an EBC customer or not, you can essentially look at your PG&E bill because all the billing happens directly through PG&E. And you will see that you have like PG&E delivery, electricity delivery charges. And you also have a line item for, uh, it'll say East Bay Community Energy Delivery Charges. And that's something important to note as far as looking at your bill and understanding what product you are receiving for EBCE. Because essentially when uh, your community decided to become part of East Bay Community Energy, uh, you would, if you stayed with East Bay Community Energy, you were defaulted onto one of our products. Um, and so you're not sure, you can look at your bill. And um, if you're not on Renewable 100, that's a great opportunity to opt up if that's something you're interested in. You can jump to the next slide. Uh, I just want to plug one of our programs because it's going to be really relevant for a lot of the information that uh, you'll receive today about home electrification, um, specifically related to uh, the generation at the house level. Um, that is our Resilient Home Plus program, a Resilient Home program. Uh, essentially, this program is uh, designed to help residents um, access and install uh, residential solar and battery backups on their homes. Uh, you're able to visit uh, ebc.org slash resilient home to get more information about the program. But essentially we work with um, a vetted solar installer to access preferred pricing for our customers. Um, and we also have a route for customers to receive a $1,250 uh, incentive to share power with EBCE when there is a high demand during that four to nine period. Um, when solar comes offline, but we have battery storage, um, you can achieve a lot of cost savings for yourself. And then EBCE will also incentivize you um, if, you, if you're if you up for that. Um, and so I'll, I'll just mention that we have a few webinars coming up starting tomorrow. Uh, they're all listed here, um, 6 p.m. each day. If you're interested to learn more about the program, uh, there'd be a great resource to really go in depth uh, as to what the program is, what the benefits are to solar and storage. Um, at your home and kind of the route for, for going that. Um, yeah, so you can go ahead and jump to the next slide. That's kind of all I've got. I know you're gonna get a lot more detail into electrification. So if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them into the chat, the Q&A, um, and I will be on standby. Great, thank you so much, Noah. All right, so I was talking a little bit before about the more of the policy uh, standpoint, but now we actually can get into what this means for your home and how we can go electric at your own home. So I showed that uh, Venn diagram earlier about decarbonizing the electricity or the energy sector and have the three parts of reducing demand, cleaning up the grid and electrifying everything. That same dynamic is really at play in your own home. Um, and if you want to make your own home carbon free, it's, it's kind of a similar process. So first would be to, you know, improve the efficiency. So things like weatherization, doing demand response. So um, getting the smart thermostat, um, LED light bulbs, and just in general, more efficient appliances. The second piece would be go to EBCE and either um, you can install solar and storage on your home. That's probably the best solution long-term, but it's a large investment. We know that's not possible for everyone. And so, you know, much more attainable <laughs> solution would be just to opt up to that renewable 100. Um, 
payment plans or EBTD, and that way all of your electricity is coming from renewable sources. And finally, that third step, once you know you're only all your electricity is clean, would be to shift away from gas, um, you know, furnaces and water heaters into electric appliances. So mostly we talked about just like the climate impacts. Um, I know that might not be the most motivating thing to everyone. Uh, it's pretty far out there. Maybe that's not really, you know, care. Yeah, I'm sure everyone cares, but um, we want to stress that there's a lot of non-climate benefits to this as well, um, beyond just reducing your emissions. And that uh, that's actually probably the bigger draw here. So the biggest one that we always stress so much is health. There's a lot of really dangerous byproducts from the combustion of natural gas, particularly in your kitchen where you're standing right above it and breathing it in. Um, you can get carbon monoxide, nitrous dioxide is a really common one that can cause asthma. And studies have actually found that children who grew up in homes with gas stoves are 24 to 42% likely, more likely to develop asthma. Um, so if you have kids in your home, you're thinking about making that switch, a stove is probably the most important one to make to, to do first in terms of health, um, even if it might not have the biggest impact in terms of lowering your emissions. And then there's a number of other benefits. Um, the biggest one in safety is just there's no risk of a leak or an explosion. Uh, I grew up in San Mateo County and I was, I remember um, clearly with the San Bruno explosion um, when I was a kid, that was really scary and it could happen again. And so we want to just, you know, get off of that, reduce that risk as much as possible. And then finally, uh, comfort, um, heat pumps, as we'll talk about, they provide both heating and cooling. So if you don't already have AC, but you're considering adding it, that could be a really great solution to do a two for one um, uh, appliance. And then finally, electric appliances are quieter and they're so much more efficient. We're gonna talk about this. They're three to five times more efficient. And so, um, if you do it right, if you combine it with either efficiency and or um, solar panels, they can really lower your uh, energy bill significantly. So um, this is some data I found from the US EIA that um, the average home on the West Coast, over 50% of the energy it uses is either from space heating and water heating. And in California, almost all homes use natural gas for those, or all single family homes use natural gas for their space heating and water heating. Um, and then the rest comes from air conditioning, refrigerators, this other category that would include plug loads or smaller appliances like um, your dishwasher, your laundry machine, things like that. But really the bulk of, of how you're using energy is coming from these two sources. And there's now heat pump and um, really highly efficient alternatives to both of these. So, I already talked about this, but I just really can't stress it enough how important efficiency is before you electrify for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's easier to do this at any time. If your water heater and your furnace are under 10 years um, old, it might not be quite time to replace those yet. And so in the meantime, you can really make sure your attic and your walls are well insulated. Um, like these two pictures, you can do air sealing, make sure your ducts are sealed and, um, and insulated. And these will save you a lot of energy, um, lower your utility bill quite a bit in the meantime, before you're like while you're waiting to um, make the bigger changes to your appliances. And Bayrent does offer rebates for all of these. We'll go over that at the end of the presentation. But um, you can get up to a thousand dollars each for attic insulation and wall insulation, and then um, like not an exact number, but smaller rebates for air sealing and um, duct repair and replacement. So it's really important to do this first. Um, and the other reason that I didn't mention is um, you wanna make sure when you replace your furnace that you're sizing it correctly. If you just replace your furnace with a heat pump without doing these efficiency measures first, the odds are you'll get a system that's way too big, which means it'll cost too much upfront. It'll use more energy than it needs to and not save you as much money. And also you just won't feel the effects. It might not actually have much of an impact on comfort if your home is really drafty and losing a lot of that warm air that your heat pump is producing. So it's really important to think about efficiency before electrification or together, um, but we always wanna stress that. So to the actual fun stuff, um, if you look into anything related to electrification, you're gonna see the word heat pump quite a bit. 
Uh, it's going to pop up all the time. A heat pump isn't one specific appliance, it's rather a technology that's used in a number of really highly efficient appliances. And so normally if we were in person, I'd ask you all to raise your hands if you already have a heat pump in your house, but can't do that right now. Um, but you should all have your hands raised because if you have a refrigerator, you have a heat pump. That's kind of an easy way of explaining it. Um, your, your refrigerator, how it works is it has, it's a box and it has a fan that blows air out of the box and um, has these lines of refrigerant that absorb the heat from that air and cool the refrigerator down. A heat pump water heater, for example, works very similarly. You have this fan at the top, it blows air in, compresses that, then it has this tube filled with refrigerant fluid that absorbs all the heat from the air um, and puts it into the water and then cool air comes out the other side. And so there's a couple of benefits to this. Um, they, the main is that they're 300 to 400% efficient, which sounds impossible. And the reason is that um, a gas or an electric resistance water heater, how it works is it burns gas or it creates friction in order to generate heat and put them into the water. How heat pump works, it's not generating heat, it's simply moving heat from one place to the other. And so for every one unit of electricity that the heat pump water heater uses, they can put three to four units of heat into that water. For a gas, which for every one unit of gas it burns, it can only put like 0.8 to 0.9 units into that water. So they're much more efficient, they can save you money that way. Um, and the other big, big benefit here is that I talked about the demand response and that that curve. Uh, what you can do with a heat pump water heater is because it's on electricity, you can run that during the middle of the day before you get home from work when electricity is cheap and clean. And then you have a well-insulated tank of hot water that can hopefully last you the rest of the night. Um, so you don't have to turn it on and use electricity during that peak time. So these are a really great solution, highly efficient. Um, there's a lot of models just now coming onto line. Um, so there's a lot of options out there. And we do offer, Bayron offers $1,000 that would go to you in rebates, $1,000 that would go directly to the contractor, and then there's an additional $300 federal tax credit. So all in all, that's $2,300 that you're getting rebated um, off of one of these, which brings it almost in line with a standard gas heater. So the same heat pump technology also works for heating and cooling. Um, the only difference is that condenser unit goes outside. It looks a little bit like an air, air conditioning unit. Um, and then there's a separate air handler that's inside that's connected with refrigerant lines. Um, and so again, in addition to being super efficient, 300, 400% efficient, um, these also provide the benefit of being able to switch directions and you can provide heating or cooling. So again, if you are someone who doesn't currently have AC, you're considering adding it, this could be a really great solution um, to avoid the cost of upgrading two appliances at once. Um, and then they also have some flexibility. So you can see here on the left, um, if you have a house that has a current central furnace with, with a duct system, you can just replace the furnace with the air handler right where it is, and then add that heat pump outside and you're good to go. Um, it'll be to work with like your furnace now, except it'll also provide cooling. And then the other option is you'd have that heat pump outside and then multiple lines of refrigerant running to different parts of the house and each room could have its own air handler. And so what that means is if, for example, mom and dad like the room a little bit cooler, they can set the room cooler, you know, the kids can set the room warmer um, and you're still being really efficient with that and not, you know, doubling down with, with how much uh, energy you're using. And we do have $1,000 in rebates available for these as well. There are some limitations with the central systems. So make sure to look into that or ask your contractor before going through that and make sure that you are eligible. Um, but again, it's a $1,000 rebate plus a $300 uh, federal tax credit. All right, I see a question about how noisy is an outdoor heat pump. They are generally much quieter than um, a normal gas furnace, um, but hopefully one of the contractors on the line can answer that in a little bit more detail. Um, and then the other big appliance that heat pumps are used in is clothes dryers. And so um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but again, there's highly efficient, 50% more efficient than a standard dryer. Um, the other big benefit is they don't need ventilation. So they're really easy to install and pretty low maintenance. And they're also really gentle and close. Um, again, a lot of these are a little bit more upfront than a normal you know, gas dryer, but uh, we do offer a $300 rebate for these, um, which brings them mostly in line. And then this is a big one that always gets a lot of questions with induction cooktops. And so 
a lot of people, their first reaction when they hear about electric cooking is the, these old coil systems that get really hot. I actually have one of those in my apartment. I hate it. They're terrible. Um, but induction is not that. That's the important thing to remember. Um, it's Inductions work not like a heat pump, but they work using electromagnetics. And so rather than, again, creating heat like a gas stove, what they do is they use a magnetic electric mag magnet to activate the electrons directly in the pan. And then the pan itself turns into the vehicle of heat. And the pan is what's getting hot, not the stove itself. And so, again, they're very efficient. Um, they can save you money in the long run. I think the, the biggest factor here is um, the indoor air quality. They do not release any byproducts. You're not breathing in any of you know that nitrogen dioxide um, that can cause asthma. And so they're much better for indoor air quality. They're a lot safer. It's hard. You can't burn yourself quite as easily. And people just like cooking on them. Um, we actually have an event coming up tomorrow evening. I'll send out the info uh, where we're going to have a professional chef who cooks on induction and talk all about why she loves induction so much. Um, but they're really you know, fast and really powerful to cook on. So a lot of people really enjoy them. It's a little bit of a learning curve, but it's not too bad. Um, and these also do have a $300 rebate offered by Bayron. And then um, I'm not going to talk too much about these since we don't offer any rebates or resources for them, but just know that almost any appliance or system in your home that burns either gas or propane, there is an electric alternative for that. And so there's models out there on the market now for electric fireplaces, heat pump cool heaters, electric grills, electric patio heaters, almost anything you can think of, there's an electric alternative that probably works just as well as the fossil fuel powered one that you might be used to. And so um, just something, if you know are doing a remodel or redoing your patio, um, something to, to think about and look into the options. Um, and then last thing I wanna to touch on here, not super fun is electric panel upgrades. So, uh, if you're switching all of your appliances from gas to electric, that's going to add a lot of um, load onto your electric panel that, that has to process. And so you really want to make sure that you have the capacity to actually accommodate all those new electric appliances. So um, most homes in the region have anywhere from 100 to 200 amp panels. Um, usually newer houses and larger houses will have the 200 amp or larger panels. Um, a lot of the older, smaller homes in places like Berkeley and Oakland might only have 100 panels. Um, if you have 200 amps, you should be okay. I would still consult your contractor, um, do some research, but in most cases, 200 amps is enough to accommodate a fully electric home. 100 to 150 amps, it's a little bit trickier. It is possible. Um, this table on the right is an example of a 2,000 square foot home with a 100 amp panel that was able to go all electric without doing a panel upgrade, um, but they had to get a little bit creative. And so before you call the contractor, maybe take a look at your panel, see what size it is, and just if it's 100 or 150, um, bring that up, see, get their advice, and um, just make sure to do some research before you go and install a heat pump water heater that could put you over that limit. And I'm hoping the contractors can, um, you know, answer any more specific questions about that or on the line. So with that, Larry, if you are able to turn on your video, um, Larry is with Electrify My Home. They're a Bayron participating contractor. He does some really great work around home electrification. He's gonna talk about a case study in Berkeley and we actually have Rebecca, who is the homeowner, uh, is also on the line and can answer some questions. So I'll take it away. Um, she is in El Cerrito, <clears throat> and she works for City of Burma. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> the basis. My name is Larry Waters, and I am the owner and founder of Electrify My Home, the first of its kind only electrification business. Um, if you have questions about gas, don't call me. Next slide, please. So why, why choose Electrify My Home? It, I've been in the trade for about 37 years and uh, kind of seen all aspects of it. Last 12 years, we did a lot of home performance work and, um, and uh, envelope retrofits, et cetera. In 2015, I installed my first 
uh, mini split ducted heat pump system and just enough solar to completely offset it. And since then, I've been like a madman about this stuff. So since then, hundreds of systems everywhere. Uh, I'm kind of entrenched in the electrification and decarbonization world, and um, we're, we're serious about it. We want to help you reach what we call good electrification, and uh, we'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Um, I'm certified through BPI and NATE, and um, I'm 100% comfort guarantee on all our products. Next slide, please. We have, a, we have a unique virtual process to start everyone off. And um, it, we have a program and a process designed to uh, understand your goals and needs. First, you reach out to my company, email, phone call, whatever it is. We're gonna send you a great welcome email that has a link to our uh, data collection page on our website. It asks you about 40 questions about your home that are age specific. And um, it sends me a really nice report at the point when I get the report, I'll do a little back history on your home, learn a little bit about it, and then we'll have a virtual assessment. So I will get you on your device. We'll walk around your house together. We don't burn any carbon coming out to your house and we don't waste any of your time. We don't indulge in bringing our stuff into your home. So you don't got to worry. It's super safe. And we can give you budget number ranges up front based on your, your home. At, at that point, if we agree on cost, then we will make an appointment to come out and measure and verify the quote. We'll approve it and schedule it, and we'll get you started on your electrification process. Next slide, please. Uh, this is about Rebecca's house in, um, in uh, um, beautiful El Cerrito. What a great little house this is. Built in 1948, 1,042 square feet. When I found it, it already had R44 in the attic space that was, uh, that was installed by another company. A beautiful job they did, by the way. She had an existing 60,000 BTU furnace in there. Anybody on this, anybody watching right now understands that that is a huge furnace for a 1,000 square foot house. She also had a 40-gallon gas tank with a water heater off the kitchen. And... Um, Here's a quote from her about knowing about the dangers of combustion gas and home appliances. Her goal was complete decarbonization. She hadn't used her furnace in a number of years because some little uh, critters got in there and kind of contaminated the ductwork. So they were doing like a lot of people do and they had the plug in heaters around the house. Those, uh, those real energy wasters. And her water heater tank showed signs of really bad spillage and we'll address that in a second. Her house wasn't comfortable and she wanted a system that could easily offset with solar and she had some limitations on her electric panel. Next slide, please. Uh, our esteemed colleagues that are on, on video here can, can see what these are, but if you're a homeowner, you should do one thing and that's go out and take a peek at the top of your water heater right now and you can use this as a guide. If you've got any kind of patterning or um, or indicators like this on the top of your tank, you should get it inspected immediately. These aren't necessarily from a water leak, what a lot of people would think. A lot of them are from uh, combustion leakage or spillage and the, the, the accumulated moisture that comes in with that spillage over time. And you can actually see the picture on the left there, there's actual scorching on the nipple right there where the, where the pipe is connected. You can see it has um, gassed off for quite a while. Next slide, please. We put a heat pump tank in the garage. Uh, we moved it away from the inside of the house so they could shore up a little extra space in the house. And kind of the one of the side benefits is her garage is going to be nice and cool this summer so she can go out there and do laundry, a nice cool garage. Um, these systems have zero carbon output at point of use. They uh, have multiple settings for performance and energy savings. And I spoke with her today and um, she has really learned a lot about how to set this system for the most efficient way. And uh, we install a mixing valve on each one of these. So uh, we get a lot of questions about what happens when the power fails. And so we set these tanks to run at 140 or 150. So the water is really, really hot. And then we adjust down the water temperature to 120 at the mixing valve. So uh, we have a lot of reserve capacity. 
if you'll notice the little picture down here at the bottom with the two energy guides, and I wish you could focus in on the energy guide on her actual water heater, but we're seeing energy guides for gas tank water heaters in the 40, 50 gallon range up to 296 a year now, almost $300 a year. The energy guide on this unit was indicating it's $104 a year. And of course, that's going to vary depending on where you live and when you use it and what type of rate plan you're on. But these systems cost less to operate than your typical gas. It gets rid of a possible uh, uh, indoor air quality problem, and it'll uh, cool your garage off a bit. And as Rebecca says, it's provided hot water for her family of four, including two teenagers that love to take long showers, and it hasn't been any problem. Next slide, please. A good electrification project always is going to start with a real load calculation. If somebody doesn't come out and measure your home, measure your windows, look at what you have in your home and actually apply it to a computer program, they're not doing a load calculation. A lot of companies will come out and they will put some stuff down on a piece of paper and say, good, your system matches page 13. This is not how we do this when we're in home performance and doing good electrification. We have to know what size system fits the house. And in her particular situation, we have a 648 CF, CFM system needed in that house. It was really coming in around 16,000 BTUs and we ended up putting an 18,000 BTU heat pump in that house. It is, um, it is a Fujitsu inverter system and we'll show a little bit more about that. Her house is all, always, or excuse me, also featured in the 2021 East Bay Green Home Tour. Next slide, please. Not only is this uh, this furnace too big for the house, it was almost too big for the hole for us to get it out. I had to get two guys on one side pulling and another guy on the other side kicking with his feet just to get the thing out of the hole on the side of the house. And that's when we say your furnace is too big for your house, this is not what we mean. What we mean is the BTU range is often too big for your house. Um, her furnace died about 18 years ago. They installed a new furnace. It was oversized and really loud. They, they, they trusted a contractor to come put this system in. And unfortunately, the contractor didn't do really great sizing at the time. And um, we were able to reduce the capacity by two thirds. They also had a 14 inch return air on this. And maybe in the, in the audience here, we don't understand the implication of a return air, but the return air duct is where the air goes into the system. And the larger that return air is, the quieter the system is, the smaller the return air is, the more noise it makes because it has to draw through with more velocity. This system had a 14 inch return air on it with 1200 CFM of furnace circulator fan. So that means it's really loud and it really inefficient. So we took out that 14 and we put in an 18 inch return air and we reduced her system by two thirds with 600 CFM. And she will tell you in a moment that she cannot hear her system operate. Next page. Uh, this is my guys under here and kind of a little bit about um, you know, our, our thinking on these systems. We reduced her capacity by more than two thirds. That saved her money. We did the load calculation that increased her comfort. We used a ducted mini split system located in the crawl space. It's 20.2 SEER, so it's super efficient. It's even more efficient than that when it's running in its lower modes. And a uh, new properly sized duct system based on the load calculation insulated to R8. Um, and we were able to reuse most of her existing locations for the ducts in the floor because the house is smaller. And uh, we increased that return air um, and uh, it made it super, super quiet. Next slide, please. Properly planned solutions create a pathway to good electrification. I'm trying to get this term good electrification into the vernacular because that's what you need to ask your contractor for. Just having a heat pump installed in your house that's going to take six or more, uh, or excuse me, four, four to six breaker spaces in your panel. We were just talking about Second ago, Chris was mentioning you have to be creative with the electrical panels in order to make all this stuff fit. The first way to do that is not to have some big clunky unitary heat pump installed that takes, if you have to run additional power to where your furnace was to run the system, that's not good electrification. We want to make as little impact on your panel as possible. So all of my systems, the most they will ever take is two breaker space, one double pole breaker. This particular system only needed one 20 amp breaker to run the entire system for the house. 
Um, it, this unit uses 50% less energy than a traditional heat pump. And the one-to-one -one application keeps it very complex. It's not a unit where there's multiple systems mounted on each wall in the house. Those get very complicated, very costly. And if there's ever a leak in them, they get very, very hard to figure out what's going on with them. This is a simple process applied like a traditional central heating and cooling system using a inverter mini split system. Next page, please. This is what they look like when they're all done. These are the indicators. You got a really big return air for quiet, a really good filter for those smoke days so you can shut those windows and turn that unit on and stay nice and comfy. A great air handling unit sized properly, new ductwork, and all of that equals really comfortable homeowners. This should be done by a specialist, people. You wouldn't take your Tesla to the diesel mechanic. You wouldn't take your Porsche to the Chevy dealer. You need a specialist for this. We are a specialist that specializes in these types of install small systems. Next page, please. For the techies out there and the, and the, 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 nerd, and the nerd energy geek people, um, I'm with you right there. I'm one of you. I am the biggest nerd you're ever going to meet. Um, these systems have some really impressive stats. This system adjusts its output. It'll go real slow when it needs to. It'll go real fast when it needs to. This gears all the way down to 5,400 BTUs at the lowest, which means it'll give you a trickle of heating and cooling when you need it, and it'll give you reserve capacity. This is an 18,000 BTU nominal system that'll actually give you 25,600 BTUs when you need them. That means that that old fight over the thermostat back in the day where your wife comes in, sorry, Rebecca, where the wife comes in and turns the unit down to 45 degrees thinking it's gonna cool faster, this one, you can turn it down a couple of degrees and it'll cool faster. Pretty amazing stuff. If you look to the right of the screen, you can see how much energy these use. And anybody that owns a hair dryer is going to realize that when this unit is fully functional in its highest operation mode in the cooling side, it's using 2.19 kilowatts. That's 2,190 watts. A really good hair dryer is using 1,850 watts. So this system is cooling your house for just slightly more energy than a hairdryer. And if you look above, it's even less difference at 2.08, 2000 watts to heat your house. That's just slightly more than one plug-in heater for one room that doesn't do a very good job. I can take care of your entire house by installing small. Next page. This is the beautiful unit that we put out there, uh, the Fujitsu. That's, uh, you know, we don't have to be brand centric on this one. These are really good systems though. Um, it's very quiet and um, extremely energy efficient, as we've said, and it's the key to good electrification. The thing about the inverter technology that is in this and that thing that we just talked about where it goes from 54 to 24,000, that is inverter technology. It speeds up and slows down. If you are during or in mid process of doing other improvements in your house, like you're gonna get the heat pump now, you're gonna get some windows in a couple of years, this unit will automatically adjust to the improvements that you make in your house and it will become the right size for whatever improvements you do. That's the, the, the magic of these systems. And what's our goal? Our goal is capped gas lines. We love capped gas lines. I live for capped gas lines. This is Rebecca's husband out there turning the gas off after the last appliance that they got rid of. Uh, I'll let her tell you about the experience with that. I'm proud of her and man, we're proud of this. Next page, please. Uh, they've completely ditched the dirty gas. No furnace operation for several years. Uh, now they got hot water now. The electric costs for her have dropped and will soon completely be completely offset with renewable solar. She will have near zero energy costs at this, at this pre-existing home because we planned this process right. She's installing the renewables that will offset it. She doesn't have a gas meter anymore. Uh, they now have AC and filtration. They can shut their windows and be comfortable during the smoke events. Uh, next page, please. Can we bring Rebecca on? Sure. Hey, Hi, Larry. Rebecca. How are you? Hey. I haven't seen you in so long. I know. Good to see you again. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I just want to say some of you um, in Alameda County may recognize my name. I do work for the city of Berkeley, and I do outreach on sustainability. And so we've been talking about electrification for years. 
Um, but I'm here today just as, you know, just as a Bay Area resident who's, you know, a, a neighbor who's really passionate about electrification. So I like to say I'm wearing my, my personal hat, not my work hat tonight. It also lets me say wonderful things about Larry. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so just, you know, really exciting, you know, um, I heard Chris before talking about air quality and in our house, as Larry said, we didn't know that the that that gas water heater it was in our kitchen. It was from the 1990s. Um, we have a really bad um, exhaust, you know, over our stove. It's like one of those microwave exhausts. We don't even know if it actually works. It makes a lot of noise. Um, but once I had done some air testing some years ago, and every time my gas water heater um, went on, we were seeing spikes in in um, in, in in pollutants in the house. Um, and I, you know, so we, but it, it, it took us a little while to get to this point. I'm glad we waited because those Bay Ren rebates became available for us. And um, it was really exciting. As Larry mentioned, last week, uh, PG&E came out for free and they actually capped our gas line at the main. So they took our, our lateral service line, um, they capped it and they took out our gas meter. And we wanted to do that for a few, few reasons. Um, you know, one, it's a lot safer for our house. We didn't have a gas, emergency gas shutoff. So had an earthquake happened, you know, our risk, our house was like at risk. Um, I had a, a coworker whose neighbor's house, actually there was a gas fire and explosion from the line and they, her house was really badly damaged. Um, also, you know, we, uh, we were in that situation, we were an older home, we had a, a, our panel was smaller and, Larry was able to add in the heat pump water heater and the furnace, but if we wanted to add anything more like an induction range, we needed to upgrade. And our electrical panel was too close to our gas meter. You have to have it a certain number of feet apart. And electricians said, oh, we're gonna have to relocate it. It's gonna be X thousands more. Well, now there's no gas line. So I can, that panel can be upgraded right in place. And when the solar company comes out, they're gonna do it with the cost of the, uh, the, up, of the uh, installation. They're including it for, you know, for free. Um, so we are so thrilled. I can just say, you know, what Larry said, the furnace amazed me. Um, I don't know that it's running. My old one, it sounded like there was like an airplane taking off in our house. Um, and the other really neat thing is with the filtration, my house used to smell kind of musty, I noticed. Like I would be gone for a couple hours, I'd come home and I was like, what's that smell? Open the windows. I always wanted to open the windows and I never noticed that anymore. Um, and, you know, I never thought in El Cerrito we would need air conditioning, but obviously the past few years with the smoke events and climate change, we, we gave it a test run when we had a little bit of warm weather the other day, we just wanted to see how it worked and sure enough, it was like, oh my gosh, we actually have AC. So I'm not as, I'm not as, you know, nervous heading into this smoky season, um, which, which I'm afraid, you know, with the drought we'll be having. So, um, we have no gas line, uh, pg &E did it, it was done in a day, um, and no cost to us. So uh, really excited about that. And I just wanna let folks know, I did drop a link in the chat for this East Bay Green Homes tour that Larry mentioned on one of the slides. Um, there's gonna be, most of the houses are actually homes in um, the Berkeley, Oakland area and a few from Contra Costa County, but there's homes all in different stages of electrification. So um, that's a free event that folks can check out too. Hey, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca and Larry. That was really great. Um, we are a little bit short on time, so I'll try to um, get through this as quickly as possible. Just might skip over some things. I want to give you some, some other resources that Bayron offers and how you can actually go ahead and get started. So one of the first things you can do, if all this sounds really great to you, but it's a little bit overwhelming, you don't really know even where your house is at, is to start with a home energy score. This is the service we offer. Uh, an assessor will come out and you walk through your home. They'll look at everything from your appliances, to your windows, your insulation. Um, and they plug it into this calculator and you will get a score from one to 10, ranking how efficient your home is. And then it also comes with a set of personalized recommendations. And so this is a great way just to learn a little bit more about your home, see what needs to be addressed um, and go ahead and get started. And there's anywhere from a $200 to a $400 um, rebate available for that, depending on how much they um, look at through the assessment. And then uh, I really wanna stress this slide. If there's one thing you should really write down after this presentation, it's the phone number and email address right here. So Home Energy Advisor, this is a free service Bayron offers. 
It's basically a call line that you can call and get free advice on your home project. And so anything from just getting some general advice on where to even start, you know, what kind of project you want to do. They can help you find contractors, compare quotes, um, answer any technical questions. This is a really, really great resource. We really want you to take advantage of it. They don't earn a commission. They're really just here to help you. Um, so please write down that phone number. There will also be a survey that pops up when you close this meeting um, and you can enter your email or phone number into that survey and we'll have one of the advisors contact you. Um, we do require that you go through a participating contractor in order to receive favor and rebates. So Larry is one of them. And then we also have Alex from All Things Good and Joe from Hassler on the line. They've been answering questions. Um, I'll give you their contact info as well. Um, but all our contractors are vetted. We know they do great work um, and they will actually handle a lot of the paperwork on your behalf. So it's a fairly easy and straightforward process to get the rebates. So the process to actually get a rebate, really the only thing you have to do is select a contractor and they'll work with you the rest of the way. The Home Energy Advisor and the Home Energy Score are both optional. We recommend them, but feel free to skip those and just go straight to contacting your contractor, um, getting a you know, getting quote from them, deciding on the project, and then the contractor will walk you through the rest. But again, it's a fairly simple process. They just need to install the upgrades, do a quick safety test to make sure there's no gas leaks, and then you get your check in the mail. Um, so this is what a sample project looks like for if all you're doing is a heat pump water heater. So you can get the two to four hundred dollars from the home energy score, thousand dollars from Home Plus, thousand dollars that goes to the contractor for our midstream program. $300 federal tax credit is an $150 rebate for the for that doing the combustion appliance safety test. Total that comes out to almost $3,000 for only doing the heat pump water heater. And obviously, if you're to combine that with um, any weatherization rebates or anything else, um, you can get up to $5,000. So I'm actually going to skip over these. I will send out a PDF tomorrow um, along with these slides that has all of this written out, uh, but you can see specifically which rebates we offer. Um, same, I'm going to skip over financing. Just know that there are financing options available. There's some that are specifically income qualified, um, some that are structured different, different ways where you can refinance as part of your mortgage, some that are more of a standard loan. If you are interested in that, um, reach out to one of those home energy advisors and they can go over your options with you. Um, and so here's some of the links to get started. Again, I'll send out the slides. You can find these links later. And huge thanks to all of the speakers, um, as well as Alex, Joe, and Rebecca, um, who were helping with questions. I know we didn't get a ton of questions, but uh, we have one more minute. So if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat now. Alex or Joe, um, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I have your contact info, but there's no questions. Even just your service area and what you specialize in, just so people know, um, or if you're taking new customers at the moment. Sure. Um... So yeah, uh, I'm Joe. Hi everyone uh, from Hassler Heating. Uh, we're located in El Cerrito. Um, we're servicing a pretty large area of the East Bay. We're doing a whole lot of uh, central heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. Um, so if you're looking for quotes on that stuff, certainly uh, don't hesitate to uh, reach out. Um, so yeah, thanks. Uh, Thought this was a really nice and informative webinar. So uh, thank you guys for putting it on. I'm Alex, I'm with uh, All Things Good. We're also out of uh, Richmond, which is a pretty close area. We do Alameda County, Marin County and Contra Costa County. Um, and this is the one 
this is where it pays to have a smaller home. This is way, if you have like under 1500 square feet, it would be crazy not to consider this. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a pretty exciting thing where the comfort, everything is just a benefit. And then, you know, why not basically? So uh, thank you for putting this on and um, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I know it's late and everyone you know, has their evenings to get to. So we're gonna end it here. Um, again, keep an eye out for the email tomorrow with the slides and some of the other links we discussed. Thanks. Thank you.